Welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Toranje Gezarian. She, her pronouns. I'm a playwright and director and founder director emeritus of Golden Thread Productions and a founding board member of MENA Theatre Makers Alliance. Very happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm speaking with you from Oakland, California, the land of Chochechnyo uh, Ohlone people. For those who may not be familiar with the San Francisco Bay Area, it is home to one of the largest intertribal indigenous communities in the United States that continue to reclaim and preserve land and to revive indigenous cultures. This is session number nine of 24 Hours for Palestine. Uh, the session title is As We Near the End, which is the title of a short play by Yusuf El Gindi. We're going to begin by watching the play first, performed by James Asher. Then we'll come back and meet our panelists. The video runs uh, about 15 minutes. Thank you, Flens. Please run the video. This isn't to numb or to shut down. This is to appreciate. Listen. I take it in and swim in the notes of the music. I imagine my body floating in the flow of the music. And I conjure a river at night. I'm floating in its current. I look up and I imagine stars. I'm safe and held in the music. I will not sink or drown. The music is my floating device. It carries and relieves me of gravity till I can stand again the weight of things. Till I can stand again the weight of what I'm witnessing. I go into the kitchen and make a sandwich. Turkey, cheese, mayo, sourdough. Let's add butter. Tomato adds texture, lettuce adds little, but we'll throw it in anyway because that's what a proper sandwich includes. Lettuce. I pick it up. This well-made sandwich and then I put it back on the plate again, understanding that it has failed me even before I have taken the first bite. I need something more immediate. Chips. I open the bag. Fat. Salt. Crunch. Mm. Mm. I love the sound the little bits make, being mashed by my recently cleaned teeth. The sound alone is enough to drown out the crying and screams as I drift along on the music and pleasure my taste buds. Have I ever looked in the mirror to see what masticated chips looks like? Let's take a look. Oh. oh. Well, you wouldn't want a visual of that while you were eating, would you? Can you imagine if you were forced to see your own mouth in operation while you were eating? Oh. You wouldn't be able to swallow a thing. Unless you had a taste for the gore of food being pulverized to mush. Oh, I have to stop staring. Then again, if I stare at this, I won't have to stare at anything else. Let's look at art instead. Instead of. Because this is what this is really about. Avoidance. Or maybe not. Maybe. Art does do actual good sometimes, doesn't it? It uplifts. It uh, pricks us awake. It activates parts of us that have been asleep for months, years. It can even spoon feed hard truths in enjoyable ways. Other times it's boring. Art can be boring, but boredom can be soothing. I will listen to Beethoven eat my chips, and look at art. What should we look at? 
Nobody mentions the Pre-Raphaelites much, do they? They're lovely. Literal, yes. That's not in fashion, that style. Figurative. Abstract is more in, or still in, isn't it? <laughs> or uh, art that's ironic, cheeky, but simply drawn and painted. Brightly lit like these works, green as green, orange and yellow like these, bodies draped in lush fabric. No. Better than bodies blown and dipped in shredded concrete, torn apart, buried, colors of stark red and rose. Not the rose color we want, really. We're doing this so as not to look at that, so... Oh, thank you. Women in gardens, smelling roses, surrounded by foliage. I love foliage. Slumbering in the pleasures of nature. Really, look at that. I will park my eyes right here and think of nothing else. One, two, three. I know nothing of this painting or its subject matter, but what do I need to know, really? To take it all in? The uh, details, the overall everything. Not even gonna analyze the politics of it all, the maleness, the sexism, the British Empire at the time in full swing, the declarations made or soon to be made that would bury the dreams of so many struggling for independence, now under the thumb of the British, who with the flick of their imperial pen get to drown the dreams of millions and seed all the wars that we have to suffer through today. How lovely it must be to have so much power. What can my precious art do against all of that? My silly aesthetics, my wobbly imagination that does what exactly in comparison? The labor, the barely funded labor, all of this creating something out of nothing put up against even one gun? Now that's a creation that has impact. That painting put up against a gem from Lockheed Martin? crafted engineering or whatever the terminology is for creating weapons, weaponry that does this, and this, and this. Mm. Power of art has about as much impact as a ball of cotton dropped on your head compared to this piece of engineering. These beauties will touch lives and make you feel stuff. These gems will turn your insides out and blow your mind in ways that art can only dream of doing. Art wishes it could be a player in the way this stuff is. I <sighs> should have been a weapons manufacturer. Really, that feels so much more relevant and useful. Every time there's a news report about some region threatening to break out into war, I'd be like, yes, please. Would I be sorry that the Line of work that I'm in is in high demand. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'd be high-fiving myself, quietly. Publicly, of course, I'd be shaking my head in sorrow, much like an undertaker who can't exactly pop the champagne every time a corpse shows up. But privately, can you imagine? Oh my God. And how much nicer to be on the side of the bomb makers for a change. Do they have to justify to themselves what they do? Maybe for a second. You can't all be sociopaths. But once you've done that, once you've sorted out all those pesky details about what you do, can you imagine the relief, the release from all of this agonizing over this or that outrage that sensitive softies have to endure? Vanished. My whole relationship to the world would be so much lighter. And with conflicts always going on somewhere, I, I'd be in perfect harmony with the ways of the world. Work, worldview, private life, morality, all in sync. Plus those guys get to go to the best restaurants. They get the best tables. 
the respect they're shown when they walk into a room, art, what I do, what I consume, what is that? It's weak. It's a weak response to life. It is only good for distraction. I am just trying to distract myself. I should be ashamed for trying to distract myself from all of this. Or this. Or this. And then I'm so mortified for being so helpless in the face of all this shit that I have to distract myself from my own uselessness on top of the horrors that I'm seeing while deluding myself that my futile efforts might still be useful despite all the evidence that it is most definitely not. <sighs> One, two, three, four. But, but, what about protest art, you might be asking? Like this. I'm asking. We're going to figure this out together, you and me. You who have bothered to show up here tonight, theater lovers, art lovers, we're going to understand our own worth in the face of all this horror. Or works like these. Or music like this. And all the pop songs, and dramas, and films, and novels, all of the works that bleed their hearts out quite openly, without shame, that wear their politics on their sleeve. These, these are the weapons of our humanity, yes? That speak, that have to speak of what we aspire to be. And claim that aspiration as a thing that punches way above its weight. This is where the pen is mightier than the Lockheed Martins and the Raytheons, the North Grumlins and the Boeings. It's not immediate, or rarely, if ever, immediate, the effect. Uh, it's subtler, it's faint. Even so, it does get in there, eventually, under the skin. It pricks us. It kicks us away, doesn't it? Makes us go, oh, slaughter. I should feel something about that. Quick, finger to the wind. Oh, other people are outraged, too. Good. Count me in. And presto. What bled on the fringes now bleeds in our living rooms. And all the politicians go, oh, we might lose more votes than the money we need from these companies if we don't vote to stop the carnage because of all of those posts and videos that reveal the horrors or the, the posts that go viral or the in-your-face poster art that screams at you to Open your eyes, all of the stories and poems that shoot straight into your heart and wreck it. And the bestest presto of them all, because of all that, the politicians at last vote to stop the slaughter. Ergo, art wins. It pricked, it nudged, it led to this, and this, and this. And boycotts and sanctions, all leading to peace and harmony and much goodwill. Yay! Pat yourself on the back. Even if the art wasn't very good, even if it was obvious and blunt, never mind, fuck aesthetics, even if it was excellent, either way, it worked. The art I consumed, the art I made, it worked. Eventually, through many twisted pathways, many twisted and probably unrelated pathways that you have to work very hard to link and make the case for that art had anything to do with ending something as implacable as war, could play a part, could be a for an actual force to gum up the machinery. You might have to delude yourself a little, more than a little, that any kind of art actually moved the needle. Might be more honest just to say that art is just a distraction. 
then that's a good all by itself. If it just gives you breathing room, we can't always be on that damn spit, roasting ourselves over the flames of our own consciousness all the time. So what if art can't substantially help someone whose back is against a wall or kneeling naked with a gun to their head? Maybe art is unique in just being so thoroughly useless in the face of man's own disgusting behavior, from polluting the air we breathe to butchering those who breathe it. Which is perhaps all the more reason to return to this. That at least reminds us of what we're capable of, right? Our humanity, our artistry, our divinity. Adorno said, to write poetry after Auschwitz is an act of barbarism. Thank you for coming tonight to my act of barbarism. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, for your funny and heartbreaking writing. Um, if you're just tuning in, this is session number nine of the 24 Hours for Palestine. My name is Toran Gizarian, she, her pronouns. I'm a playwright and director coming to you from Oakland, California, the land of Chochechnyo Ohlone people. Uh, I am now joined by my panel members. Uh, Shola Askeri, interdisciplinary artist, electroacoustic composer, performer, and educator. Roberto Varea, founding faculty, performing arts and social justice program, University of San Francisco. Heather Raffo, playwright and actor, and Yusef El Gindi, playwright. Uh, for more information about our panelists, please look for their biography in the event program on Golden Thread's website. Welcome, everyone. Um, the play, As We Near the End, or What Adorno Said by Yusef El Gindi, here, um, focuses on the speaker's attempt to grapple with whether or not art is useful during a time of dire conflict. In our conversation, uh, we will wrestle further with the question of art's effectiveness or ineffectiveness to resist the machinery of war. Can art be of any use at such a time? Is it a distraction? or can it move the needle on anything? Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, our conversation by asking Yusef to speak about the uh, how this play came to be. I mean, obviously I can make some guesses, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Yusef? I will answer the question of art's effectiveness definitively. You will leave today knowing exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, yeah, I'm Yusef uh, El-Gindi. Um, Playwright, um, and uh, I'm on the ancestral land. I'm based in Seattle, and on the ancestral land of the Duwamish people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, wrote this. You know, certain things happen in our world where you, the imagination is just frozen or seized, and you really can't think or uh, of anything else or imagine. You know, and you 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 have to respond in some way. And in responding, you question whether or not, you know, is what I do, my skill set of any value in this uh, uh, moment. And um, hence the, you know, uh, this play and the attempt sort of wrestling with that um, question. Um, by the way, can you hear the loud party noises behind me? No. No. Okay, good. Good. So they would they would have now they would have a party now after anyway. Um, so yeah, so now so that was really, you know, and and it's a question I continue to wrestle with. Um and um you know, I, I do I mean, first of all, there is no choice but to con to do what to to deploy your skill set uh uh towards 
that thing that has grabbed your conscience and your heart and your emotions and simply to um it's almost you uh, at least i have no choice but to engage with what's happening you know the same thing happened with uh, in 9/11 i remember my whole uh um outlook on literature in 1982 changed with the invasion of lebanon uh, uh up until that point i was a literature major and very fascinated with the Bloomsbury Group and Oscar Wilde and art for art's sake. And I thought politics had no business in art. And I was really quite, you know, adamant about, no, 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 you know, don't muddy the waters with politics. And 1982 and that invasion really just kind of shocked me awake and going, of what value is art, you know, if not to um, uh, engage with the world I'm in right now. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, it's. I continue to wrestle with that question. I do think it makes a difference. Uh, I think somebody said, I forget who said that the, the the purpose of art or culture is to make the revolution irresistible. And I think um, um, everybody's little contribution hopefully engages with the audience to draw them in into the uh, uh, political crisis and to engage further with it. So my hope is that that's what art does. Thanks. And just, is this, did you write this like last year, November, No, no, no. It, I, I wrote just this recently? Just recently. I mean, I wrote this, I don't know it was, I forget it was end of last year or beginning of this year, but it's, it's in direct response to what's going on. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, maybe I'll just go to Heather next, uh, go from playwright to playwright. Um, I mean, your first work, uh, Heather, Nine Parts of Desire, was a direct response or personal, per, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but personal experience of uh, war in Iraq. Um, yeah. You want to talk about that or you want to just jump in? Yeah. I mean, I'll say that... Um Hi, I'm Heather. I am on the homeland of the Lenape people in Brooklyn. It's always an honor to be in a room with you, Taraj, and Yusuf, with your words and your humor and your your biting barbarity. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thanks for, for um, having me in conversation. And I really appreciated the um, the wrestling that Yusuf's piece causes me to have about the the feeling, the mundanity of of life, the potato chips and the lettuce and the tomato as we all get on with our our days next to the atrocities and the futility of being an individual, but also the incredible solidarity of vision. I think that a lot of um, what it brought up for me, um, that nine parts writing that and working on that during war and occupation for over 20 years was the the pull and the wrestling of what it means to be here versus what it means to be there, right? And I think that where where I tend to fall maybe now even more than when I was writing nine parts is that addressing um, while art might not directly, let's say my art directly impact the war in Iraq, what was happening on the ground. Um, there's so much work to be done in this country. This country is such uh, an incredible link to what is happening everywhere in the world and the conversations we have here and the level of um, emotional labor that artists are doing that really very few other people are doing is, is imperative to learning how to um, have conversations or embrace or be in community with people who are both across the street and across town let alone across the world. So I think that that's, I'm, I'm seeing both the, the local and the global in Yusuf's work. 
and uh, it's resonating with me with how I feel pulled between between the two. Thank you. Shole or Roberto, which one of you would like to jump in? Go ahead, Shola. I think Roberto's uh, waiting for you. Hi. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Tonanj. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Sahar, everyone on the back end who made this possible. And um, and uh, Golden Thread and my fellow panelists. And uh, thank you, Nasa. Uh My name is Shola Asgari. I go by she, her. I am uh, an interdisciplinary artist who works with uh, sound quite often and performance as well. I'm also an educator. And I'm uh, uh, coming to you from uh, the Hujin territory, land of the people. Uh, and yeah, it's, I really, I'll say, I'll, I'll sort of respond to a few things that um, Yosef brought up and Heather brought up earlier as well, which uh, I think one of them was uh, from Yosef sort of like the role of art in that huge sort of shift that happened uh in 82 for you and the way that you were approaching the field that you were working within and um and so the questions that came up following that and sort of you kind of wrapped up uh, arriving to sort of the uh the sort of purpose of art and right the role of that within revolution and i really appreciated that and i think one of the things which maybe we can get into a little bit later it brought up for me too is the sort of i think like the dangers as well on the flip side of seduction in in aesthetics as well, if we look at like the rise of fascism and such on um, sort of the flip side and also the sort of role of abstraction in art within modern times. And um, they're so directly related. Uh, and so I think that's such a, um, a crux or such a, um, a moment of conflict <laughs> uh, that is a part of conflict. Um, that we're experiencing and continue to experience. And and it's something that I think a lot uh, about within the arts. And so exactly like, where is my work useful at this moment? And there are multiple times where I've had uh, just moments where I've had some kind of a shift in the way that I think or the totality of that experience and my role in it. Um, and and where where is that experience useful to what end and um at what moment does that need to come in it's something that i've thought about a lot earlier this year as part of a group of artists who altered their work at yerba buena center for the arts in uh, san francisco and that was a direct response to the silencing and repression of a lot of voices and in that moment i remember uh actually a dear collaborator of mine dila aladib who um uh, I work with quite often. I remember in the fall, she asked, like, let's do something like, what should we do? And I think at that moment, I was still a little bit not, I was processing a lot of the questions that this panel is about. Um, but I remember thinking, where does the energy go right now? And I think at that moment and in that action, it felt this is, this becomes about not so much that experience of art, but of opening up that, making that violence visible through the sort of structure and i think spaces where um art can offer us spaces of imagination and spaces of, to articulate uh our our sort of um our uh can it, it can help us articulate or offer these spaces for us to articulate the abstraction of our everyday experiences uh within violent structures um and so it's certainly something that, and, and Heather, you'd sort of mention about, right, like the violence of here, right? The sort of like the here and there and that violence of this current space becoming visible um, or be, being, it is visible, but the work that there is to be done. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of work and it's not the seductive work, <laughs> uh, but there's a time for that as well, I feel. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Shirley, because many of our um, audience members may not be familiar with what happened with the art exhibit at Yerba Buena, could you just 
briefly tell us, uh, just tell us what happened. Oh, sure, certainly. And when, um, when that was also. Yeah, so it was on um, it was on February fifteenth. Um, Yerba Buena Center for the okay. So uh, myself, Yerba Buena Center has a triennial. Oops, sorry, my Bluetooth. Can you hear me? Okay, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts has a triennial in the Bay Area, California. It's called Bay Area Now, and this year was the ninth iteration. It actually opened up in October, and the exhibition lasted for about nine months. And um, it's sort of a kind of a survey of what's happening. It's for a lot of artists, it's a major sort of shift in career or an introduction. So it's kind of a momentous kind of time for many in their career. And, um, you know, the artists that they selected were very active in their communities in various ways. And this was what attracted, um, I think, a lot of the curators to bring us in. Our exhibition happened to open on, I think, October 6th. And uh, alongside our exhibition, there's a lot of programming that happens. So it's not just the work that you see in the space, but it's a lot of like programming, film series, performances, talks, panels, and so on, and workshops. Uh, throughout this time, when I came to the role of artists wanting to do something in relation to Palestine, holding workshops, doing anything. The museum was silent, said no, no, no. And it actually um, forced one, not for, well, it actually silenced or repressed two artist works that it had commissioned to do something. One of them being uh, Jeff Chung's mural on the public facade of YBCA. And he had used uh, the sort of just the colors of the Palestinian flag in his piece. And, uh, the center said, no, you have to either change those colors or remove them. And these colors were actually kind of, you know, is, is, is visible shapes within kind of bodily form. Another artist, uh, Lucasa uh, Rontham Verismo, they had commissioned to use the marquee wall, which was appointed by Tony Bruguera, who is a Cuban activist artist. And um, Lucasa wanted to write um, I believe, Free Palestine, and that was also a no. And a few other things that were ongoing. So anyhow, on, on February 15th, eight of us uh, in in collaboration and partnership with the U.S. Palestinian Communities Network, Palestinian Feminist Collective, Palestinian Youth Movement, and the Joyce, Jewish Voice for Peace, we interrupted an evening of programming and we took it over. We each altered our own artworks in the piece in the, in the exhibition and uh, and on suing, we had a large protest with calls to um, with calls uh, or demands that were to end the censorship of voices to end uh, uh, board members with interests with Zionist interests and investments and to uh, end the siege on Gaza and anyhow so so this is what happened on February 15th consequently the museum shut for one month and put out a lot of false statements about us into multiple news networks uh reaching internationally and afterwards uh the city was a opening a case or a hearing into it and at this moment uh, I think about maybe like nine or ten directorial positions at YBCA have resigned since, but we have not yet heard anything. Thank you. Thank you. Roberto, it's all yours. Hi, everyone, and, and thank you um, for having us. Um, my name is Roberto Varea, and I am uh, coming at you from and see the Ramatusho on the territory in what is uh, referred to as the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, and yeah, again, thank you, Golden Thread, Howell Round, the organizers, and thank you uh, for, for this space, for this conversation. I submitted a bio, um, but I also want to introduce myself today as a survivor of state violence. As much as what I do and have to share comes from that place. Uh, and I joined the theater in my, in my uh, uh, a theater company in my home country during a very violent time, a time when it was highly censored. First and foremost, as an act of personal restoration and not as a way to have a platform to express myself, which was a close second, but not necessarily the main reason. And of course, then from that space, uh, a lot of appreciation for the necessity of asking 
the questions raised by Youssef's work, um, for the necessity as artists to pause, perhaps to be silent for some time when confronted by the reality of ongoing or recent traumatic violence or its, or its memory. So how, how to engage a such overwhelming subject matter? Hard to articulate if you're a victim, even more problematic if you're a witness, uh, or both, as I would say in my case, uh, if you're a survivor, both someone who was victimized, but also managed to survive and bear witness. So Yusuf and, and before him countless others, and of course Theodore, uh, uh, dictum being central to this, sort of try to grapple with this question, and, and, I, and, I, and I think it's incredibly critical that it's being asked again and again, even though we were preceded by, po by, a, by a panel of poets, and, and, and we sort of feel that the answer was already implicit in Yusuf's work, of course. He's, he's asking the question through a creative act. Um, but but we have to we have to pause and ask it because the enormity of genocide, the deep steering of, of our soul after witnessing a sense of helplessness, of social or, or moral orphanhood, uh, confronting the need to confront the manufacturing of narratives that that try to explain the unexplainable, making it uh, palatable even through an explanation. Uh, so we're moved to respond. And, and of course, a, a deeper, perhaps a existential question for an artist as to, you know, what, what is my role now? You know, do I, do I do the Hemingway thing and <laughs> join the battalion um, or, you know, and, 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 or do I stick to the pen? And, uh, and, and we are mindful that there's also the pen that does harm even though as to we're mindful that art has been compared to weapons uh, 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 quite often, you know, and I love uh, Gabriel Celaya's Spanish Civil War poet talking about poetry is uh, gun loaded with future, sort of the, the possi possibilities that, that are so hard to even begin to envision, to even you know, think about when you're in the midst of darkness. So, um, how to respond, how to speak about this, how to overcome paralysis born out of fear of doing justice to the martyrs, to the victims, perhaps even fear of the repercussions, just critically a part of what we're living through today. Um, the repercussions of what you said, that so far they can take the shape of, of losing your job and your your sustenance, which is not a minor point, but, you know, of course there are those other moments where you know, you fear for life itself. Um, what to respond to those who say, this is not a time for action, this is a time for thoughts and prayers. As it's often put in the context of mass, mass shootings in our country. A slow motion massacre, you know, being conducted in our midst, to which we're so, so often anesthetized to. Um, so, I, I, I want to quickly refer to a couple of things. I know we want to have maybe a, a time to, 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 to chat, and I see that time is, is leaving us. With, but uh, I, I've been wrestling with these questions, and I, and I found uh, you know, trying to ask, to talk to people outside of, 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 uh, of theater or, or, or theater in academia, um, to help us make sense uh, about what we're doing when we know that there's no choice but to, to as Brecht perhaps said it, not, not sure, uh, what do we do? Um, uh, it, will there be music or, or singing at times of war? Well, there will be singing about the war, right? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about um, uh, Jean Paul Lederach, um, um, somebody who, who I met in and dealing with sort of the intersection of art and peace building as he was incredibly amazing doing work uh, uh, helping afro uh, descendant colombian farmers deal with both the violence of the guerrilla and the and the government and he's talking and uh, and, and also uh, salomon lerner febres who was the uh, the director of the, uh, the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission that dealt with the findings and, and was in charge with looking for um, um, 
information about uh, what they thought were going to be about 25,000 disappeared people in Peru after the quote-unquote dirty war, and there were more than 80,000 after the work he did, and, 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 and talked to him because he also was critical about art being part of the Truth Commission work. And, and he enlisted a theater company and an incredible team of photography uh, uh, photographers and curators to create an exhibit to help people understand, as he said, people are not going to read, you know, an 800-page Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, document for, with, with his findings. How do we connect with people about this? And 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 the theater piece uh, was actually three theater pieces, and they were conducted by a theater company from Peru called Yuyachkani, who had performed in the Bay Area. Some of you might might have might have known about him. The name Yuyachkani is Quechua for "I remember," um, which is a critical aspect of what art can do about this. And and and, and it also in Quechua is the same word for "I am." So being and remembering in Quechua language are, are together. And, and uh, both of them uh, were critical to say identity and character. So we're born uh, as an individual, but we develop character in relationship and we become a person. A person which in Spanish is persona and in Latin as well, and that's the Latin word for a theatrical mask. So we develop a character in relationship, and and um, and Lerner Febre said something that struck me, and I remember word by word. Violence has a thousand faces, but they all relate to the breaking of the bonds that give us both humanity and meaning. And he and he poised that that sense of being a person is born out of relationship and, and, and listening to Musal's poetry er, earlier, Musab's poetry earlier, um, yes, he, you know, the, 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 who I am is not just me and my circumstances, it, it is the olive grove that my family had and was turned to splinters, it was the family home that was bulldozed, it is the, the school where I went to and, and maybe had my first kiss be, be, behind uh, uh, the, the stairways uh, that has been now flattened by a bomb. All of these things is, 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 is who we are, and the breaking of those, of those bonds uh, are what renders us victims of a conflict. So he said, there's no other space like theater um, in its paradoxical nature, its capacity to hold more than one truth together, its capacity to present us with a, with a language to speak the unspeakable, to reveal the invisible, to make it visible, uh, that this due to this paradoxical nature of, of, of theater that, uh, that allows us to engage with subject matter that otherwise we, we, we couldn't find words to. And it, it is in the, in the restorative work that is a dimension of that, that healing, um, that um, many of us, and I can speak for myself, but also work that I've done in places like Rwanda with survivors of the genocide or, or the Balkans in Bosnia with survivors of, 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 the, of the violence there, that there is a, an incredible transformative and healing effect, effect that comes out of finding a way to recontextualize represent as a theatrical representation. The act of violence now contextualized uh, in ways that we can again derive meaning, in ways that we can incorporate them into a narrative of ourselves in the world that has been violently uh, decapitated by, by brutality. Um, so I will stop here because I you know, I, I have a lot of too many notes. This this is really a, a, a steering conversation for me, uh, and, and thank uh, Yusef for for reminding us that that an aesthetics about this has to be born of an ethics that requires for us to pause and ask these kinds of questions. Thank you, Roberto. Thoughts, responses, who wants to jump in? I was going to ask you, Taranj, what your, what your 
thoughts uh, were regarding, you know, this question about effectiveness. I mean, you ran Golden Thread for a while. You you did a lot of political plays. Um, I was wondering what what your feeling is. Uh, I mean, f for me, I think it's um, maybe it's obvious that you know activism has always been a part of my art creation. I don't know that it was necessarily by choice. It was um, something that was um, not forced on me, but maybe um, I, I was I found myself in a position where I had to defend my artistic choices and defend my aesthetic um, seducers, to use Shola's words. Um, and um you know and that came that sort of put me on a path of um advocating for my culture and advocating for my people and creating a space where we could all come together and have a bigger voice so we couldn't be you know shut down um for me uh you know theater has always been a space where i find myself and i look for answers to questions so um that's sort of the big picture but really you know i can't help who i am and the stories that i want to tell and if that makes me political then you know then i'm political but but um you know theater is a means to survival and and storytelling is a means to survival so for me there is no question that it's vital creativity is vital because that's how we know we're alive um and life without creativity really has no meaning for me um so uh i i love the complexity of the of the struggle and the the you know, and I think in this moment, it's it is a, it's 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 a struggle to to hold on to sh shreds of humanity, um, but that doesn't change the fact that we are human and and our bond, as you know, Roberto said, or uh, it's like you know we are we are connected to each other. So loss in Gaza is loss in me, and and I am compelled to express that. I can't, I can't not express it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean. So I, in a way, I kind of don't have a choice at, in the matter. Anyone else wanna? We have a good. 10, 12 minutes still to, to I, I, talk. I would, so. I would, I would I might, I have a question about, um, you know, very often uh, when you write a play deemed political, critics will sort of, you know, crit critique it as uh, less than, as, you know, whether it's didactic, as it's didactic or it's, um, and I get the sense that certain, types of political theater are ghettoized in the culture, you know, and um, sometimes I feel some uh, resentment that um, that my focus should be deemed as not as valuable to the culture, somebody who talks about some domestic, you know, what's it like dating in, you know, I don't know in the in the in today's world and uh, plays that uh, veer away from politics and you know there may be social issues, but um, I'm just you know the notion of political theater. I think it's I don't know. I just have a question of, about the status of you know why political theater here is deemed as not as worthy of attention as. Um, other plays, other subject matter, and that as a writer, I'm always up against that over and above, you know, um, uh, wrestling with the the craft and, you know, 
Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure everyone has an opinion on that, but I'll just say that uh what I've learned is that the the instinct in the US is to be in denial of our history and of the crimes that have been committed uh in the name of this country and this nation and continue to be committed. And so when you confront an audience with those facts, even in a highly dramatic personalized story um it it's difficult to to you know digest and it's and people will fight you on it so that's that's been my experience but i wonder whether uh if you've yeah i wonder what your experience has been i'd say i've kind of had the opposite experience in that the the plays that i wrote while political were seemed deeply welcomed not at first i mean what i'm appreciating about this particular zoom room and i think it bears mentioning deeply right now is that um many of us artists are of a generation where we absolutely remember the censorship after 911 right and this is something that in conversations with younger um, Middle Eastern theater artists in particular, they don't have that knowledge. They literally don't have the knowledge of being completely censored and, and that there, there was no space <laughs> to be on American stages. Not only was there not a genre of Middle Eastern American theater, but when, when, us early artists were saying, we have it, we want to speak it, it's a, it's a time of war. Um, we were flat out rejected and censored, right? So by the time Nine Parts somehow, you know, took no for an answer <laughs> a thousand times and then got my one in, right? Then it was theaters that had rejected the play wholeheartedly, suddenly wanted it in their next season because of the reviews. Um, but there was censorship even after that. So, I mean, I'll, I'll say, Tourange, that I, I, there's two ways I'd answer that question is, yes, Yusuf, censorship and a complete unwillingness to actually engage and create pipelines and create a culture for Middle Eastern artists over decades, right? And here we are now in a, in a moment where so many institutions are outside the theater as well, are unwilling to engage with a Palestinian voice let alone an Arab voice at this moment. Like it is, it is as big a crisis as it's ever been. The flip side of that, Torange, was that Nine, nine Parts, Nora, these plays that um, created conversations. They created conversations not only in the community, as in the Middle Eastern community, they created them across communities. And I found audiences to be very willing so where institutions weren't, people were. For me, what was most interesting was when people from the Pentagon and the military came and had as an emotional experience as Arab women would need to come backstage and sob and cry and talk and right like the 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 deep um, heart centered communication that worked in rural communities and on main stages, what was very interesting to me. Um, and I, I think that that is what gave me the most hope actually was what Ohio taught me, right? What Michigan taught me, what, what, you know, like Tennessee, rural colleges in Tennessee taught me more than what Kennedy center taught me right but in in all respects um i am in pursuit of the conversation and i think it's there to be had and i'm very willing to shape shift who i'm talking to <laughs> mm -hmm. and use any situation to establish a um a conversation of care and hopefully get at 
what needs to be spoken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Shola John, you want to add um, a little bit? So I'll just mention a few things. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I'm coming from a background within uh, visual arts, mostly. Uh, I think one of the things that's when thinking about what's considered political art or protest art, are, and I think you said we have touched upon this, but it's just, it's that categorization. Uh, and I think Taranji did as well, but that categorization that somehow uh, it, it separates it. It's a category for identification, but also a category where something is marked. And uh, I, I think it's really, it, it's such a question within it, within the arts of like, who is politicized? Who as nature of who they are, their background, their ethnicity, their race, their everything right um is is considered to be politicized and within that then what works are considered to be political and what works aren't and i think the, the i feel i feel it's all of our works and our interactions are inherently political um just as much <laughs> as any other work of art or any other artist and i think that this way it's it's really it's such a way to not actually talk about the very real political relationship that works that are not deemed as political art have to our current time and the responsibility that perhaps they have and the structures that support it and such. But I'll I'll sort of mention within the arts we uh, from this there's a sort of a field called socially engaged art or socially engaged practice that's a little bit different and i feel in some ways how in the areas where that may have failed in a certain kind of criticality i feel that for perhaps for artists it's open certain artists <laughs> it's opened up some kind of tools or some kind of a route to not necessarily within that, but in other forms, critically engage with such institutions and have that critique of that structure. And uh, and I think within that too, like the role, I've been thinking about this a lot also, is like the, the artist isn't thought as, as much the work being articulated is labor. And so I think within those spaces, how that labor is leveraged within or such institutions. Uh, it's it's some of the things that I've been thinking about, and that being also a part of the practice as well. And I think, Taranj, like you said, you were sort of uh, weren't getting the responses. You were being uh, in, in sort of turning and creating something or creating some kind of structure within that mm-hmm. or against that. Mm-hmm. I'm also seeing we have a few minutes, so I'll just kind of abruptly wrap up here <laughs> because I'm curious for any other remarks and such. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're approaching uh, sort of the end of our session. Um, I'm getting a, a wrap up uh, text. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, it feels like we can go on for four hours. Uh, and I, I actually feel the need to have the conversation for four hours, but <laughs> maybe we'll do it another time. Heather, yes, did you want to say something? Question for Yusuf. I, I wonder, I wonder if anything has, if, if, if he f- has any different feelings since he wrote the piece, it's been many months. We're deeper into this um, war. I'm just wondering if any, if anything's changed for you about how, how you're seeing your voice and the role of art now? No, I mean, if anything, I'm a little bit more depressed uh, than before. <laughs> but but um, I don't I, I don't want to end on a two minutes. I don't want to end on a depressed note. But yeah, it just feels, I mean, it was like the Iraq war, all the protests leading up to that and trying to, all the voices against and it just didn't do anything, you know, it just uh, the wars happened. Um, so, but, you know, I do, I, it's not even a question. I mean, it's like Sisyphus. I mean, you 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 have to roll, you have to do it. It doesn't matter. It's, it's you are obliged to, to push that rock up that hill, uh, regardless of whether it, you know, comes tumbling down and you don't reach your goal and you hope somehow it does. You hope something happens in the many conversations that art generates. You hope something is triggered and action is taken, which might lead to, you know, a uh, change of some sort. So you do it anyway. 
So <laughs> thank you. I'm going to I'm going to uh, close us out. Uh, I apologize to the next session. We're going to be one minute over because I have to read this closing <laughs> paragraph. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. Youssef, Heather, Roberto, Shole, as well as James Asher, who performed in the monologue, and Aaron Gilly, who edited it. I'm grateful to Golden Thread and partners for creating this space for artists and everyone who's working tirelessly backstage. Uh, I'm holding on to what Ahmad Tobasi said in the first session of 24 Hours for Palestine. He said they don't want us to dream. That's why they destroy our theater. Uh, and also in the earlier session with Armenian artists, it was said that erasure is complete when we give up. So I'm walking away with uh, from our time so far today, more convinced than ever. Uh, of the power of art and the need for continued creativity as a form of resistance and restoration. Thank you again, everybody. Um, I now introduce the next session, Palestinian Art and Queer Resistance, moderated by Nada Liftoviyev.